every year and uh, year after year, thousands of uh, men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. Uh, they're they're in shock initially. Um, where do they go? Where do they turn uh, the, the way forward? Well, I think you know, like <laughs> so many things, we we are healthy until we're not. Um, that's especially true for men who tend to not have the same entrance points into the healthcare system in their younger years, like women. Uh, for men, it can come as a shock. Um, usually they're very well. Uh, they have no symptoms. It's usually detected, hopefully, early. Uh, and when that's the case, they don't have any symptoms. Of course, if they're detected later when they do have symptoms, their options are much more limited. And fortunately, that's only about 10% of men diagnosed with prostate cancer, and that's because of PSA. With the use of PSA, we capture and diagnose the disease earlier when there are options for various lines of therapy. In the absence of PSA, for example, in China, where PSA is not done routinely, 50% of men diagnosed have metastatic disease mm. and will die in three years as a result. In our society where uh, PSA is available, maybe not always ideally used, uh, then only 10% uh, are diagnosed at that stage. But again, coming back to your initial point, um, for those men who are diagnosed early, uh, they um, usually are guided through the process initially by their family doctor who makes a referral to a urologist and that's usually done initially anyways when the PSA is elevated as the urologist tends to organize the biopsy. So that tends to be the initial point of discussion is uh, you have a cancer, um, its uh, level of aggressiveness is usually discussed and then according to the risk of progression relative to the person's age and life expectancy various treatment options are discussed. You mentioned the PSA test, uh, maybe you could explain what the PSA test is and why it has become controversial in recent years. Well, PSA stands for prostate specific antigen. It's a blood, uh, it's a, a protein that's produced by the prostate only and normally is secreted into the seminal fluid where it plays a key role in supporting the semen and fertility. Um, with blocked glands, PSA back leaks into the bloodstream and especially in cancer where all glands are dead ending, they get higher levels of PSA in the bloodstream. Um, PSA is an excellent marker of risk of prostate cancer over time and performs very well when compared to, for example, a mammogram. It identifies those people who are at risk of having a cancer and they then have to have a biopsy to confirm whether or not there's a cancer. The challenge with PSA, like all tests, is that they are, uh, uh, they have to be made, uh, their use has to be integrated into various other um, uh, risk uh, para parameters. And if you just use PSA as the only indicator for whether or not somebody needs a biopsy or not, then it increases the rate of biopsy. A biopsy is uncomfortable, has about a 1% infection rate associated with it. And in addition, it can lead to the diagnosis of some cancers that are low grade and indolent. So unless the diagnosis is uncoupled from treatment, it can lead to over treatment. Now, as with most things in science and in medicine, as tests are used, implemented, researched, their continuum is evolved towards improvement. And yet some people look on PSA the way it was behaving 15 or 20 years ago, forgetting that that's no longer the case. So today, if you're a man with an elevated PSA, whether or not you get a biopsy is initially decided upon whether or not your gland is um, the appropriate size, uh, your health is appropriate. And increasingly now we incorporate MRI into that paradigm. And so that imaging modality allows some men not to need a biopsy. So again, it reduces the impact of PSA on biopsy rates. But in addition, and most importantly, P 
PSA does lead to the detection of lower grade cancers, where over the past 15 years, um, Canadian urology has actually taught the world to uncouple diagnosis from treatment. So half the men diagnosed are actually not treated, they're placed on active surveillance. So that reduces the impact further on PSA driven over detection and over treatment. Men who have a PSA and level one evidence, randomized trials, men who have a PSA have a much lower chance of dying of prostate cancer than men who do not. And so that's why it's important that at least men be provided that, with that information and allow them to have a, um, uh, an informed decision themselves as to whether or not they choose to have the test. And right now the way the system is set up in British Columbia is that it actually is paternalistic and puts the pressure on the man that the system is not allowing you to even have access to that unless you pay for it yourself. So it's just paternalistic. Everywhere else around the world, a man is educated about whether or not he wants to have a PSA himself. And if he does, then the system pays for it. Okay. So, so what, what are the uh, main treatment options today in BC for a man with uh, pr prostate uh, cancer? Mm -hmm. If your disease is diagnosed at an early stage, we, like every other aspect of medicine, and in particular cancer, we risk stratify the tumor. And that's based upon tumor characteristics and patient characteristics. Patient characteristics, how healthy are you? What's your life expectancy? What are your urinary symptoms? Do you have any bother that can be influenced by one treatment versus another in an adverse or beneficial way? The tumor factors are based upon tumor volume, tumor grade, PSA level, uh, which ultimately risks, uh, predicts a risk of progression, metastasis, and death from that cancer. So we then break the patient down into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk disease. And if you have low risk disease, we tend to recommend active surveillance, which, is non, which just means repeat biopsies and imaging over time. If you have intermediate or high risk disease, then the treatment options are either surgery and radi or radiation. And with radiation, whether or not that's seed implant, or uh, radiation with hormone therapy. My uh, research shows that for every one uh, patient who gets um, uh, brachytherapy radiation, uh, there, are, there are five or more uh, men uh, have uh, their prostate removed. So why, why that imbalance? Well, I think it's the way that um, uh, the patient and the physician interprets risk versus benefit. and. Um, if you look at um, uh, the relative risks between surgery and brachytherapy, they are quantitatively similar in the first couple of years, but qualitatively distinct. So you have to look at the impact on the two main areas, erectile dysfunction between surgery and radiation. Surgery, it tends to be more upfront with radiation therapy, it increases over time at a much more dramatic way, rate. With brachytherapy, you get real bother from frequency, urgency, and urgency incontinence in about 10% of men, which are not manageable if you're in that 10%. With surgery, you have a 5 to 10% bother rate from stress urinary incontinence, mm -hmm. which usually is managed with just a pad inside the shorts for protection in 5 to 10% of men. But in the several, you know, 2-3% of men with real bother, that tends to be correctable with a minor operation. So it all depends on how people weigh those risks and benefits, but you also have to then look into what are the particular second line treatments that you can have. If you assume that both have approximate similar cure rates, if you recur after brachytherapy, there is no additional curative option available for you. If you recur after surgery, another 50% can be salvaged and cured by post-operative radiation. So that approach allows for more than one shot on goal, so to speak, with regards to cure, which is important in all cancers. The more curative modalities you can apply to any particular cancer, the greater the chance for long-term control. 
And a final thing to consider as far as relative differences is that with radiation, it's difficult to estimate the long-term adverse effects over time because they're not captured as well as the early side effects from surgery because you're within the system usually with surgery. But the effects from radiation accumulate over time, sometimes 10, 15, 20 years after the initial treatment. And it's so much more difficult in any system to capture that kind of information and hence accurately uh, uh, advise patients on that risk over time. And finally, as you bundle all those things and look at direct com uh, indirect comparisons between surgery and radiation, which are not possible in a randomized trial for various reasons, but if you look at large data sets of patients who choose radiation versus those who choose surgery, and look at prostate cancer death rates 10, 15 years down the road, then surgery in every one of those analyses outperforms radiation. Now recognizing that there are many reasons and confounders that influence that result, in general when that information is provided to a person, they may choose surgery or they may, may, may choose radiation. And so our job is to provide the evidence. It's up to the patient to interpret that evidence under our input and uh, make an informed choice. I, I talked to your colleague, uh, Dr. Larry Goldenberg, uh, you know, he's a noted uh, Urologist, urologist surgeon, and uh, he said he tells all his, his patients that he, he suggests that they uh, have a consultation with a uh, uh, radiation oncologist, but he, he suggests that only about 50% actually do that. Would, would you like to see a, a policy in BC where uh, every man uh, has at least a consultation with, uh, mm. with uh, the surgeon as well as the oncologist? No, I think a policy is an excuse for not thinking, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a reason for uh, bureaucracy to creep and uh, um, uh, create inefficiencies in a system. I think many people who come in uh, can make their choice and decide what they want. If we, it's our position to offer it to everybody and if they want that opinion, a second opinion, that's great. But to force an opinion on somebody uh, who says they don't want it, that's not good medicine and it's not good use of resources. I travel around the world looking at ways other countries deal with this op uh, opportunity to uh, get informed decisions. And in Britain and in Australia, they have multidisciplinary review of every case. Mm -hmm. But all that is because the system makes it a policy, it becomes a very quick checkbox and it, it makes a farce of what a multidisciplinary clinic is. So uh, I think policies uh, are uh, best avoided. Um, guidelines are important because uh, they help guide things. But a policy to me would be um, very problematic. The Vancouver uh, Prostate Center has uh, uh, courses available to, to men. Yeah. Um, the last time, I said a couple of years ago, of all the men uh, who did uh, had were diagnosed with prostate cancer, but only about 15 percent. Uh, could actually attend these courses. How, how do you get the word out to uh, sure. uh, the other 85% uh, of the courses oh, available? Well, yeah, I decision? think this is why we've evolved a way to try to educate people when they're diagnosed mm -hmm. in a way that um, um, allows them to make an educated decision. And the whole process has to be set up so that a person five years down the road minimizes regret on their decision making. And so in our case, we've set up a series of seminars and education modules, um, initially anchored here in Vancouver, um, but we also make available reading materials and online materials to help people access that information. And more recently, have received provincial funding to now send these modules out to Kelowna, to um, um, uh, Vancouver Island, and over time into other smaller communities around the province. So that's an alternative approach to education mm -hmm. rather than um, you know, making it a policy for having somebody attend another consultation when they've decided that actually that's not they, what they want. Um, and um, uh, I think it's a, it's a much more efficient use of resources and I don't think we frankly have enough radiation oncologists to be able to deal with that volume problem.